Uh, that's the end of my sort of housekeeping notices for the session. Um, just to say this is our last official LEC seminar for this academic year and we're looking to have a new format to the programme for next academic year with more in-person involvement um, as well as still being able to include uh, visiting speakers over the internet. So uh, keep an eye on the LEC events page of the website uh, for information on that. Um, and on that note, I will hand over to Kevin to, to introduce the speaker and chair the session. And if you want to submit questions as we go, you can write them in the chat um, and then we'll, we can uh, take more at the end. OK, thank you very much, Ali. Um, welcome, everybody, to this seminar. Uh, Ali actually explained to me one of the main purposes of the LEC seminar series is to tell interesting and inspiring stories, uh, particularly for our young researchers and students. Um, so on that note, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Perihan. Um, maybe she doesn't want me to say this, but she studied here in Lancaster, well, way back, probably around the year 2000, something like that. Yeah, from 2000 um, to 2006. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, she's one of our alumni, and initially she came here as a master's student, then stayed to do a PhD. Um, she was an excellent student, one of my favourite students. Maybe I shouldn't say that. but uh, <laughs> Thank <was> you. <laughs> uh, and she's gone on to become one of the world's leading researchers in her field. So she's going to tell us a little bit about that story, that, that journey of how how she got into her research and how her career developed. Uh, I think it's a it's a great story and a really inspiring story for us all. So over to you, Parihan. Uh, we're all looking forward. Okay. Yeah, Kevin, thank you very much for these all nice words. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad to see that you still remember me in good way. <laughs> yeah. So um Okay, Ali showed me how to share my screen, so I will just start it now. Okay. Then, so can you see my screen now? Yep, we can see your presentation slide. Yes, That's great. Good. All right, okay. Okay, so once again, thank you very much, Kevin, for inviting me for this like, seminar series. And uh, to be honest, I was I was a little bit hesitant <laughs> when I heard about it uh, because I didn't think myself a like leading post researcher. But <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. So for all your support and letting me know about this. So uh, I don't think I am one of the lead post researchers, but <laughs> I'll just tell my ordinary story to current students. So uh, and I will tell them how it feels working with you. <laughs> OK, so. Uh, at the moment, I am a, a faculty member uh, at uh, Bursa Technical University uh, in uh, Turkey, uh, and I'm at this institution since 2013. Uh, before that, uh, I shuffled around a little bit and then Finally, I uh, joined this institution and uh, since then I'm here, but I don't know what's going to happen in the future. So briefly, if I want to talk about my educational background, uh, I have an undergrad degree in environmental engineering. Then in Turkey, I had a master's degree between 1997 and 2000, so you can calculate my age here. <laughs> then, uh, as Kevin said, uh, I went to Lancaster for another master's, and then uh, during my master's, um, I I was so keen on getting a PhD <laughs> with Kevin, uh, working with him, uh, knocking his door quite often, saying, Kevin, I want to have a PhD, but I don't have money. <laughs> so then uh, after my PhD, I went to Canada for a postdoc. Uh, this is my educational background. So if I want to tell about my uh, professional background, uh, after graduating as an environmental engineer, 
Uh, for one year, I work in the Bangkok provinces in Turkey. Then uh, I joined uh, Akdeniz University as a research and teaching assistant. Uh, then I was a postdoc researcher at Environment Canada for three years, and I work as a research scientist at the same place for two years. Then I decided to come back to Turkey and I joined Bahçeşehir University in Istanbul. I stayed there for two years, then I moved to Bursa. And since 2013, I'm at Bursa Technical University and holding different positions like assistant professor, associate professor. And since 2019, I'm a, a faculty member as a full professor at the Environmental Engineering Department of Bursa Technical University. So how this journey started and how I ended up in Lancaster. So indeed, it was just a fortunate. Uh, I, I I always wanted to have a master's or PhD uh, in the US or in the UK. And it all started with, um, I heard about uh, a fellowship announcement. Uh, this fellowship was announced by Turkish Education Foundation and the British Council. Uh, maybe you have heard about it, Chivining Scholarship Program. And uh, it started with this, and I applied for this program three times. So first time I took the exams and in the interview, I couldn't get the fellowship. Second time, the same thing happened. And the third time, the um, director of the uh, Turkish Education Foundation, uh, she she realized I am so keen on getting this fellowship. So she said, OK, if any extra money comes into the budget, then we can support you. And thanks God, <laughs> there was an extra money. So I got this uh, scholarship and uh, that time I had the acceptance from uh, the three universities in the UK, Newcastle upon Tyne, uh, Imperial College and Lancaster University. But when I heard about this uh, scholarship, it was around, I think, October, November. So Imperial College and Newcastle Upon Tyne said, our semester already started, so we cannot uh, admit you here. But for next year, we can hold a, hold a place for you if you want to join a master's program here. But uh, luckily, Lancaster University at that time, I'm sure it is the same here. They had uh, three semesters in the in the courses, so I missed the first semester, but they said you can uh, complete your credits in two semesters if you like and you can join us. So I decided to go to Lancaster University. So my journey started. So I got registered uh, in Masters in Environmental and Ecological Sciences in 2000 and uh, stayed in Lancaster until August 2001. And um, that time uh, I prepared a Masters thesis dissertation uh, on the like role of the stomata on the uptake of POPs. Uh, indeed, in my master's in Turkey, I studied POPs as well, but in a different environmental media. Is uh, It was seawater and mussel. Uh, I, I, I had experience in like uh, POPs analysis and uh, instrumental analysis, etc., but it was not very intensive. So uh, from that study, indeed, um, I was working with uh, Jonathan Barber. He was a PhD student with Kevin. So um, I, I undertook uh, a small part of his PhD thesis and I did the field and lab experiments. Then, uh, yeah, so Jonathan and uh, Kevin was satisfied with the data and uh, we published a paper uh, on the data we obtained in that, uh, in that study. So then how I met Kevin. <laughs> um, as I said, uh, during my master's in Turkey, I had experience in uh, POPs analysis and um, assessment of different uh, environmental media. And I had some data 
uh, from that study and I was working on the manuscript and I was looking for a journal to publish it. Then uh, I looked environmental pollution journal and when I uh, see the editorial board of the journal, uh, Kevin was an editorial board member that time. And I was like, uh -huh, someone at Lancaster University, he's here, he's in the editorial board. So uh, one day I made an appointment with Kevin and I knocked his door uh, to show my data and to ask his opinion if this data is good enough to publish in environmental pollution. As you can see <laughs> from the name of the journal that the study was published, obviously it was not good enough <laughs> to publish with environmental pollution. But thanks to Kevin, he directed me uh, quite uh, well. He guided me quite well. And he said this data is more suitable for marine pollution bulletin. So I prepared the manuscript and uh, luckily the manuscript was published in this journal. So this is how uh my first contact started with uh, Kevin then uh, after I completed my courses it was time uh, for the selection of the dissertation topics and Kevin announced a couple of uh, dissertation topics and uh, the study I mentioned earlier it was one of them and uh, I told to Kevin that I want to work on this project. So he introduced me to jo Jonathan and we worked together. So this is how it started. Uh, I must say uh, right from the beginning, uh, going to Lancaster University, going to the UK for with this fellowship, my uh, main goal was uh, finding a PhD fellowship indeed because uh, that time I already had completed my master's in Turkey, but I knew it was a good chance for me having this second master's degree, but meanwhile looking for opportunities for the PhD fellowships. Because as an overseas student, unfortunately, since we are not a member of European Union, uh, you know, the tuition fee uh, is quite expensive compared to the European Union students. So I knew I needed support. So Several times, Kevin probably will remember, I knocked his door and the same sentence, Kevin, <laughs> I need money. I want to have a PhD, but I need money. So then he was very supportive. He never said, no, I don't have money. He said, OK, let's look for different opportunities, what we can do and what, where we can find money for your PhD studies. Uh, while I was searching uh, financial support for my PhD, uh, one day I saw a banner on the screen of the computer in the library saying it is the last day to apply for overseas research uh, award scheme. And it was just the last day. And I just ran into Kevin's office saying, OK, here is the opportunity maybe, but it is the last day I want to apply for this. But that time I needed reference letters like application forms, everything. And I still remember that day Kevin just sat like you know, on his desk and he just helped me to write up the like um, reference letters and uh, he asked to another uh, professor at the department to put a reference letter for me. Then I applied for this uh, fellowship. And after three months, the results came and I was not selected. And I was so upset, but still I remember Kevin said, OK, don't get upset. We will look for another opportunity and we will try our best. I'm sure we will find money for you. Then. It was about the time to leave the UK to come back to Turkey. Uh, one day I found a letter in my mailbox from the ORS uh, Foundation. It was saying, OK, now there is additional funding and you are one of the selected candidates. So as you can see, all my studies with last minute additional funding. So I can say never lose your hope. <laughs> And uh, after I got my overseas research studentship, uh, I applied for the Peel Trust studentship of the Lancaster University as well. So thanks to these two uh, award scheme, 
uh, and also Kevin supported me for my living expenses because overseas research uh, award scheme uh, pays only the difference between overseas uh, tuition fee and uh, home tuition fee. So there is still a difference and also living expenses. So uh, thank you very much, Kevin. He supported me a lot with my expenses, living expenses. And also I got this peer trust studentship from the university. So I was uh, very lucky to complete my uh, PhD studies. Then during my PhD, uh, I guess <laughs> Kevin was trying to get rid of me. <laughs> he offered me to go to Canada. Uh, and it was a great opportunity for me because that time, uh, that time my boyfriend, now my husband, he was having his master's in New York. And Kevin asked me whether I would like to go to Toronto for to do some part of my studies over there with Terry. And I said, yes, of course. So my uh, my adventure to Canada started. So during my PhD, I visited Environment Canada and I worked with Terry, Terry Beidelman. You see his picture. He is the uh, Santa, I call him. <laughs> uh, three times I visited uh, Environment Canada. I worked with him. Uh, and these trips indeed are were very, very important for me. I learned a lot during these trips. So apart from my scientific experiences, uh, I learned a lot about Canadian life and I learned about what is cold. I mean, in Turkey, when we call it cold, it is not cold. So in, in Canada, it is, it is cold. So Canadian winter is totally different than any winter in the world, I can say. And uh, also, as you can see in this picture here, uh, I learned short is not a spring or summer clothing <laughs> for Canadians. It's a winter clothing. They are crazy people. Well, I'm just, I was trembling from the cold. They just wear their shorts and runs around. And also I learned it's a big country. Like, I mean, commuting, uh, traveling, it takes really, really time. It's a huge country. So it was a different experience for me what I uh, knew from my country or from Lancaster. So it was it was very, very like um, important and contributing uh, experience for me indeed. OK, so during my PhD, I couple couple of uh, I published a couple of uh, papers, so I just selected uh, some of them. Uh, the highlights, uh, the first paper we published, it was on chiral uh, OCPs in global background soils. So the importance of this study was it was a lar first large scale study of OCPs and antimers in background soils. So this study led us to think further on like chirality and uh, studies on chiral uh, world. And uh, we set up a bunch of experiments after this study. So the second study after this global uh, soil study, uh, we decided to set up this experiment. This, uh, this study is particularly very like um, important for me because uh, we traveled a lot to Scotland from Lancaster with Kevin, uh, because when we look at these global background soils, we noticed that there were, there were two soil samples from Scotland and the soil samples were collected only like 200 meters away from each other, one from woodland and one from, from grassland. And we saw uh, the enantomer fractions, uh, degradation of the enantomers are uh, totally different than each other. So then uh, we started questioning, OK, what is the reason for this, death, this result? And then we decided to set up a controlled experiment in these two sites in Scotland. So it was, I think, around five or six hours driving from Lancaster, and we went there. As you see, I'm not saying 
we set up the experiment. I can say <laughs> Kevin set up the experiment and I mostly took the pictures and uh, and the picture on the left is you see it was a marshy area and it was muddy and you know like a professor in mud in dirt <laughs> and he worked a lot for my thesis I can say. Thank you Kevin. Uh, we set up this experiment and then uh, we combined the results with uh, controlled laboratory experiments and we collaborated with Kirk, Kirk Sample, and also Lisa, Lisa Yantnan uh, from Environment Canada, and also uh, Jacqueline, Jacqueline Stroud, Kirk's uh, former PhD student. So it was a collaborative study combining the results from field and laboratory, and we published these results in ESNT in 2007. Then uh, another uh, experiment or study in my PhD uh, is the macrobe story. I call her it uh, macrobe story. Uh, previously, Sandra Meyer from Kevin's group, uh, when she uh, when she went to Toronto Environment Canada to work with Tom Harner, she conducted some experiments in this field. So the this field is it was a marshy area and. Uh, it was subjected to a heavily DDT usage to kill all the mosquitoes and to convert this area to um, an agricultural uh, land. So it's quite big land, uh, and uh, but it was heavily treated with DDT. Then uh, after Sandra's uh, study, uh, we decided to uh, make a experiment to measure how much DDT is volatilized from these soils, from this whole area uh, to the atmosphere during different seasons. So we set up this uh, experiment and uh, we used sonic anemometer to measure the eddy fluxes and we did uh, something of air, air uh, at different heights. So uh, after we collected these uh, data, uh, we calculated, as far as I remember, uh, a total of probably uh, 70 or 80 kilograms of DDT each year is getting volatilized from this uh, area, this agricultural area to the atmosphere. So this study is particularly uh, important for me because uh, I sent the uh, study details to uh, ACA's national meeting, which was held in Atlanta in uh, 2006. And uh, there was a award scheme. So uh, this study was selected as the uh, first place winner uh, for this Young Scientist Recognition Award. And uh, we flew to Atlanta together with Kevin uh, and I presented my uh, study over there. And uh, it, it it is one of the memories I never forget, you know, these uh, making this presentation and uh, you know uh, presenting the results to these all big guys uh, at ACA's meeting. So another study I never forget. I can say this is the first experiment I conducted in my PhD and I can say it is the last experiment I completed in my PhD because I had to repeat this experiment three times. So each time it took me at least seven, eight months to repeat it. And finally it worked and we got some results. And the biggest lesson uh, I got from this experiment is uh, the more you are motivated to work, <laughs> the less the instrument or your experiment uh, works. So never give up, uh, keep trying and uh, at the end, uh, I'm sure you will get your results. So in 2006, my PhD finished and uh, don't ask me how many papers I published. <laughs> uh, the, I can say I published minimum number of papers to graduate my uh, PhD. Then what is next? I was thinking what I am going to be doing. Shall I go back to Turkey? Because that time I had a position at the university and I should go to uh, join Akdeniz University as a faculty member. And then uh, shall I stay in the UK for another couple of years or 
Uh, my husband started saying, maybe you should come to Canada because that time he applied for immigration to Canada and uh, he was saying, okay, if you, you should come here. We should stay here for a couple of years until we get our citizenship. Then we can go back to Turkey. And meanwhile, I was thinking what I am going to do. Then, uh, as you can guess, I decided to go back to Canada uh, for a postdoc study. And during these studies, I met these two great people. I, I, I cannot say they are my supervisors. They are my like mentors. They are my friends. And thanks to them, uh, I learned a lot. So Professor Terry Weidelman from uh, Environment Canada, uh, he, he used to be at the Atmospheric Research Experiment Center. And uh, Professor Derek Muir uh, at CCIW. So uh, I met them earlier during my PhD. Uh, but during our discussions with Kevin, Derek and Terry, uh, after our uh, travel to Atlanta for ACS meeting, we traveled to Toronto together with Kevin and we discussed with these two great people what could be uh, opportunities for me for a postdoc. And they had different projects that time. Uh, Terry had a fund, uh, some fund uh, for chiral pesticides and Derek had funds for PFOS, uh, and since I had experience with chiral chemicals uh, from my PhD, I decided to go uh, work with Terry uh, mainly, but uh, Derek also was involved in the study. So uh, we we managed to work all together and uh, for uh, three years for my postdocs. So uh, during my postdoc, I carried out several studies, but the main uh main subject was chiral current to use pesticides cups so uh what i did is uh i did some gcms uh separation method developments for some of the chiral pesticides uh that didn't have any methods separation methods uh in literature and also we did uh, fate assessments of these uh current use pesticides in different environmental media in in uh, in Canada. So uh, since this starting of my talk, I keep talking about chiral chirality. Uh, I'm sure many of you know about uh, chirality, but chirality is like um, it's a phenomenon and it is like your chiral chemicals are like uh, they have enantiomers and enantiomers are like your left hand and right hand. So they are they are not super imposable. But uh, like physical chemical properties are identical, the same for both enantiomers. The only difference is a biological degradation rate. So when you when these chemicals, let's say, enter into the em uh, environmental compartments like water, aquatic environment or uh, soil, uh, microorganisms uh, prefer degradation uh, at different rates for different enantiomers. So. Uh, based on this information, uh, we can estimate if a chemical, a chiral chemical is recently released into the environment or it was a past use. So we, when we look at the enantiomer ratios, we can say uh, we can say about this. So during the postdoc for uh, enantiomers research, uh, chiral research, uh, we conducted uh, surveys in uh, Great Lakes. Uh, with the research ship of Environment Canada, we collected water samples and we looked for uh, enantiomer ratios of uh, different chiral cups, mainly metallochlor uh, and mycoprop and dichloroprop, because these three uh, were the most uh, most uh, used uh, current use pesticides in 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 Ontario in Canada, and we were sure we we would uh, find them in uh, Great Lakes uh, environment. So, in addition to Great Lakes, we worked in uh, Ontario streams, small creeks. So we uh, collaborated with. Uh, John Strucker uh, from Environment Canada and Jeff Small, Alisto and Sean Bacchus. Uh, these people, um, they are like um, 
like Alisa and Sean were, were like responsible for sampling and Jeff and I uh, work on the instrument, etc. And after all these studies, uh, all these sampling campaigns, we published a bunch of paper on the fate of the chiral uh, current use herbicides or like other pesticides in uh, Canadian environmental compartments. So three years passed. I finished my postdoc. So what is next? And uh, I started looking for real job. When I say real job, of course, postdoc was a real job, uh, but like a permanent job. What should I do? It's like I cannot keep working on a contract basis or like maybe like one or two years contract. So I was looking for a um, for a permanent position, uh, but that time in Canada there was uh, economical problems, so government decided not to hire uh, NIF staff. And um, during that time, Derek Muir had uh, a job opening uh, to work on Northern Contaminants Program uh, preparation of the assessment report, because every five years they prepare an uh, assessment report for the Arctic. So I was offered for this program for this uh, position, and I work uh, as a resource scientist at Environment Canada between 2009 and 2011 for two years. The, in two years, we prepared this report uh, in 2013, and Derek, I, and Jason Stowe were the editors. There were different chapters, uh, different people contributed to these chapters. So my main duty was gathering all the data from these people, uh, I think, yeah, Crispin, Crispin from Lancaster University, he wa he contributed a lot as he he conducted research uh, uh, in Arctic and getting all this data and organizing the chapters and uh, like collaborating with these people and the um, preparation of the of the report. And at the end, Derek and I and uh, Jason uh, published this uh, report. So during this report preparation. Indeed, I work with great, great people like uh, Tom Harner. You probably all of you know his name. Uh, Crispin, thank you, Crispin. He contributed a lot. Bridget Brown, Haley Hunk. I mean, she she or oh, she, she is a Arctic researcher, totally Arctic researcher. And Eric Reiner, like Amelia de Silva. These people are all from like Environment Canada or different universities. And uh, Mehran Ali, I just want to mention that Mehran, Mehran was a great scientist and I learned a lot uh, from him on mass spectrometry. He was an expert on mass spectrometry, spectrometry and last April, unfortunately, he passed away. Rest in peace, Mehran. And uh, Mahiba, Mahiba, she was a, a resource scientist uh, working in Tom Harness Group. She's Egyptian. She got retired five years ago, and I still keep my connection with Mahiba. Uh, I can say uh, during my like uh, visits to Canada, my stay uh, in Canada, not only I met with great scientists, I also made a really, really great friendship. Mahiba uh, is one of them. And I don't call her friend. She's I call her always mother. I mean, she was like a mother for me during my stays. And in this picture, you can see my uh, elder daughter. She was around one year old, <laughs> and she used to spend uh, time a lot with my uh, with my family. So then, 2013, 11. Uh, my resource scientist position ended and I applied for a couple of positions in Canada. Uh, but I can say in Canada, getting a position is very challenging because like so many people with good PhD degrees, but so little uh, positions available. Then uh, after getting answer no <laughs> from a couple of places, I decided to come back to Turkey. Uh, to pursue my career in Turkey. And uh, that time, uh, I sent a CV to Bahçeşehir University. It's a private university in Istanbul. As you can see in the picture, it is located right by the Bosporus. The, like, the view is great. The, like, the buildings are great. And I, I joined this institution. I worked there for two years. But as I said, it, it, it's a private university and it was a total disappointment for me how these private institutions approach to science. So 
uh, I was so upset with their attitude to science, like, you know, all they thought about their profit, their money, that's it. Uh, no respect for science, for scientific research. So I decided to leave this institution and I was thinking of going back to Canada, but thanks God there happened another opportunity in Bursa. Uh, Bursa Technical University. At that time, it was just uh, it was a newly established university. It was just two years old when I joined this institution in 2013. It was uh, it was established in 2010, and they were looking for somebody to open the environmental engineering department. And I was the first faculty member to join this university. And uh, my main responsibility was uh, setting up the laboratory. Here you go. This is what I like. So I joined Bursa Technical University in 2013, and since then I live in Bursa. I work for this institution. So just briefly, uh, as I said, it is a very, very young university compared to uh, Lancaster University, and it is a quite compact and small university compared to Lancaster University. We have around 9,000 students, including masters, PhDs, and undergrads, and uh, we have different faculties. Uh, our department is under Faculty of Engineering and Natural Sciences. Uh, we have different departments under this faculty and Environmental Engineering Department is one of them. And we are 10 faculty members at the moment. And uh, we have five research assistants and um, I think we have around 15 PhD and master's students. So, OK, so Probably when you think about the laboratories, uh, the facilities at Lancaster Environment Center and uh, other departments at Lancaster, I mean, our infrastructure is not comparable to yours, but still that's enough to continue Pope's research. So uh, I do have a laboratory. Uh, I do have all the like uh, necessary instrumentation to prepare the samples and also to analyze the samples. So we have ICPMS in my lab. Uh, we have GCMS, LCMS QTOF we have, and also I recently purchased a direct mercury analyzer. And uh, we have GCECD. So with these uh, five instrumentation, we continue our research. And I do have a very small research group compared to Kevin Jones. <laughs> so uh, Ashkin Birgül, he's an assistant professor. Kevin knows Ashkin. He was a postdoc for one year with Kevin. Uh, I think it was in 2008, if I am not wrong. And I have a postdoc, Merve. She's working on uh, mainly atmospheric gases, mercury, and also aquatic environment, pops, uh, fate. Uh, Kubra is a PhD student. She is working for in indoor environments. Sumeira, uh, sh last week she left the group. She was here for eight months uh, from Pakistan, and she conducted uh, research in uh, mercury and pops in Pakistani env uh, environmental compartments. And I do have two master students. Indeed, I do have more master students, but. They are still taking their uh, courses, and two of them, Özge and Sena, they are at the dissertation level. They are preparing their uh, dissertations. So um, I do collaborate with uh, national and international people. These are the main collaborators at national scale. Uh, Mustafa Odabaşı, uh, he is one of the uh, most famous POPs researcher in, in Turkey. He publishes Erat and Said and Aysun. Uh, they are also uh, uh, conducting uh, POPs research and they have so, so many publications. And uh, like Gülen, uh, Gülü and Fatma Öztürk, they are uh, also uh, POPs researchers and uh, like air pollution, they, they work mainly on air pollution. So internationally, I still keep my bonds with uh, these big bosses <laughs> and great friends. So uh, I still keep my collaboration with Kevin, with Derek, uh, Terry. Recently, I started a collaboration with Frank Vanya on um, gases, uh, elemental mercury in atmosphere and passive sampling of that. So uh, 
I am trying to uh, create the first nationwide inventory, atmospheric mercury inventory, to submit the MOE for uh, Minamata Convention uh, submissions. Uh, I collaborate with Ivan Holubek from Czech Republic, and uh, we mostly collaborate on uh, revision of the national implementation plan on POPs uh, for the country. Still, I collaborate with Lisa, great friend, <laughs> and time to time she sends me the data and I write up the manuscripts. Crispin, we completed uh, two projects in Turkey. He traveled to Aydın. Uh, and in closed uh, cropping environments, in greenhouses, we, co we uh, completed projects. Henry, he's from uh, University of St. Petersburg, uh, South Florida, and he stayed here for one year as a visiting researcher in, I think it was in 2016 or 17. Bondi, Bondi, uh, Kevin's former PhD student, he's in Sierra Leone, uh, director of EPA Sierra Leone. But when he was in Kuwait at, uh, at the National Laboratory, uh, we collaborated a lot and now we do have a couple of papers submitted to journals for publication. And my recent collaboration with Dr. Jabir Said from Pakistan, we are working on uh, POPs and heavy metals emissions from uh, e-waste recycling centers in Pakistan and uh, Turkey, and we are trying to compare the differences. Uh, so I just want to mention a couple of past research, what I did and uh, what publications we made. After I came back to Turkey, the, my first publication was um, heavy metals levels in indoor dust. Uh, when I came back to Turkey, I noticed that there is a gap I mean, no one is working in indoor environment, indoor pops, uh, indoor environment pops or heavy metals. So uh, the first thing I got a small funding from Turkish uh, National Scientific Research Council and uh, I collected that samples and this was the first uh, publication I made. And then in the same dust samples we published, uh, I, I investigated PBDs and uh, novel flame retardants and I published a data on that. Uh, I can say my uh, first big uh, fund was from uh, Turkish Scientific and Technological Research Council to investigate atmospheric levels of selected POPs uh, on a nationwide scale. So we conducted a passive sampling in that study uh, in different provinces. So every three months we traveled all around these provinces, almost uh, 7,000, 8,000 kilometers we drove. Uh, and uh, we collected the samples, soil samples, air samples, and uh, we investigated the levels of POPs. Uh, it was a really, really good teamwork, I can say, uh, conducting all these uh, great scale study. So then, since I had the uh, since I had the dust samples available in my laboratory, uh, we collaborated with Lisa and the Mahiba to compare the levels uh, in in uh, three different countries. So, and uh, we analyzed these samples and we combined our results to compare uh, the results in Canada, Egypt, and Turkey. So what I am doing now, uh, I want to do so many things, but as you know, science and research requires <clears throat> money. So as long as you get the funding, you can uh, carry out your research. Uh, at the moment, I do have a fund, again, uh, from Turkish Scientific Research Council. It is a, a collaborative study with Dr. Jabir Said from Pakistan, and uh, we are uh, monitoring the emissions from uh, e-waste recycling sites um, for POPs, uh, mainly for PBDs. The project is on PBDs, but we are looking for NFRs <clears throat> and organophosphate flame retardants, all bunch of chemicals in these samples, the heavy metals, and also uh, gases mercury. So uh, this is the project I collaborate with Frank Vanya as well. Uh, Frank Vanya developed this passive uh, mercury sampler, and uh, it was very kind of him providing us uh, these samplers to us uh, at a very low cost. So we deployed all these samplers. Uh, at the moment, uh, I am studying 28 uh, e-waste sites in Turkey, and Jabir is studying, I think, uh, 
42 eBay sites. So we are very close to finish the results, getting all the like numbers, and then uh, working on the uh, working on the uh, publications. And I think Javier's student Kazim is in Lancaster now, uh, and we are collaborating with Kevin to write up our uh, results. So another project uh, we are doing. Indeed, we finished. We have the results now. What is in the diaper? We know what is in the diaper, but apart from that, <laughs> we want to know what is in the diaper. And one of my students, uh, my master's students, she's looking for phthalates in different brand diapers uh, we purchased from the supermarkets in Turkey. So a total of 32 different brands. Some of them are like local uh, manufacturer and some of them are international uh, brands. So um, what she did is uh, these diapers, different size diapers, she analyzed like top sheet, absorption layer, back sheet, fastener tape, and if there is any super absorbent gel or polymer, we analyze all these and we look for phthalates. And dietyl phthalate is one, one example we found in these uh, diaper samples. So from these results, we are, we are trying to calculate two main data first, the exposure rate of the uh, of the kids from diapers uh, through, uh, through uh, dermal contact. And also uh, based on the data uh, given from Turkish Stat Statistical Institute, uh, the number of the kids who are using uh, diapers uh, in Turkey, uh, environmental uh, phthalate load to the landfill sites or disposal sites through diapers. We are trying to calculate these rough numbers. So another project, uh, this is uh, my postdoc is working on, besides her own project on Mercury, uh, the shopping shopping receipts. So we collected around 350 shopping receipts, uh, thermal shopping receipts, uh, thermal paper receipts uh, from different uh, utilities. And we look for BPA and BPAs. And you can, as you can see, uh, in addition to BPA, uh, there are different uh, bisphenols like BPB, BPS, BPZ in these papers. Even uh, we we purchased a paper, thermal paper, certified as a BP, BPA free. Yes, it was BPA free, but the level of BPS was uh, very high compared to the BPA level. And one more project. This is a last minute uh, good news. Uh, I it just came to my notice last week. Uh, we have put a cost action, uh, and it is approved now. Uh, it's uh, one health drugs against the parasitic vector borne diseases in Europe and beyond. And the project head is uh, Professor Maria Paula Costi from uh, Italy. Uh, 32 countries involved in the project and uh, 68 proposers from all over the world. So hopefully uh, we will put further uh, research proposals under this One Health scheme uh, to get more funding. So I think I'm done. I'm finished. And uh, this is, I think, uh, my last slide or I have one more slide after this. And after all, as Kevin said, in 2000, I uh, went to Lancaster. It is now 22 years and I am 46 years old. So you don't need to calculate how old I am. Uh, I have a couple of advices to uh, to you guys, the, the, the ones who are having masters or students or undergrad. So what I learned after all these uh, studies, my experiences, I can say the passion is the difference between having a job and having a career. So, uh, I mean, having a job is important, but having a career is also very important. And uh, I always keep my passion in science. So, and being a scientist is less a decision for me than a state of the grace to be worked towards. So I, I like being a scientist. I like uh, doing research uh, and even now, uh, my mom complains a lot that I'm spending like a lot of time in my lab and uh, uh, with my students <laughs> rather than spending time with my kids. Uh, I can say even now 
every weekend. If my students are working in the laboratory, I just come to visit them. Uh, and if the instrument is working, I just come to check it. So, I mean, I really enjoy uh, working, working science. And but meanwhile, I really, really grateful for all these people I mentioned in my presentation who helped me a lot. First of all, Kevin, who helped me a lot to find a fund for my PhD, uh, and he encouraged me a lot. And uh, many people supported me in different ways, like mentally, psychologically, financially. So I can say this, I mean, if we call it as a career, this is not, the, I'm not the only one who uh, accomplished it. I can say many people contributed to it. And I know I can't imagine a more satisfying career than being a scientist now. Even if if someone asks me now uh, if I want a different uh, job or like if I want to progress uh, in science, I can I can choose it again. I can do all these things again. I really enjoy my uh, my uh, my research. Uh, but I must say it takes really, really serious investment, first of all, of your time and your effort. Uh, to continue scientific activities, as I said, science, science needs money. And in these days, unfortunately, it's not easy to find funds for your research. But still, I don't lose my hope. I keep looking for further funds and uh, I never give up. And must, my last slide, I really, really thank to, first of all, Kevin for all his support, all his uh, mentorship and i can say at the moment whenever internationally i apply for any like project proposals anything i am so proud to say that i work with kevin jones and i can say i benefit from that a lot and also terry the Santa <laughs> and Derek, the wise guy. <laughs> it doesn't mean, uh, Kevin, you are not wise, but <laughs> you are you are uh, my uh, supporter. Kevin, uh, Derek is like wise guy, <laughs> and they are like my my elder daughter. She calls him uh, Grandpa Derek. So uh, I can say with these three people, uh, beyond being a relationship, being a like student and uh, and a mentor, uh, I can say we became really good friends. And finally, I really thank to my husband. <laughs> he is very, very supportive. And whenever I decide to do something, especially like moving internationally, he never tried to stop me. So uh, he's very supportive. And I now, I now for, uh, have two kids. And uh, like this picture was taken around two two years ago. So my elder one, uh, she knows she's not going to be a scientist, definitely, after she sees my miserable life. <laughs> and little one, she doesn't know anything yet, uh, but she likes coming to the lab over the weekend with me and uh, especially watching the PCMS auto sampler when auto sampler moves and uh, carries the samples. She likes watching it. And I think she's going to go with that, <laughs> with being a scientist. So once again, Kevin, thank you very much for all your help, all your support. And I thank everybody for listening to me today and joining to this seminar. Thank you. Wow, Parahan. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, we're, we're getting quite a lot of echoing coming there. That's better. That's better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so thank you for, for telling us not just the science. I mean, the science, of course, is interesting, but it's kind of your journey, your adventures, um, and really a fascinating story. And I'll ask people if they've got any questions or comments in a moment, but I just wanted to share with you some of the words I wrote down when okay. uh, when you were talking. So uh, in no particular order, I wrote down fantastic memory. So, you know, you, you've been able to remember so many events. Uh, I've written down 
Perehan never gives up. Yes. <laughs> Now the head of the university is very uh, complaining about this. <laughs> I yeah. always say no is, a, is not an answer for me. <laughs> uh, I've written down, you often, you said so many times, I learned a lot from so-and-so, so-and-so. So I think, you know, you always keep a very open mind. And I've written down, always works collaboratively, always very flexible in the, in the fields and the work areas of work I've written down takes every opportunity that comes along so yes we've been fascinated in the science story but I think uh, as a kind of case study of what it's like to be a scientist and the, the personal tra traits needed and, and the approach you, you've done a, a wonderful job thank you thank you Kevin so, thanks so to you. with that praise <laughs> with that praise and that appreciation I, I does anybody have any questions or comments for Perihan? Okay, if nobody's coming with a question, I, I'm interested in your in your opinion about the sort of relative importance of the of qualities. So, you know, how how much do you need to be a brilliant scientist? How much do you need to have passion how much how much do you need to work hard to to be successful and, and to make this uh, career or profession mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, i can say you don't need to be very smart <laughs> it doesn't mean we are stupid people but <laughs> you don't need to be <laughs> very smart i think i mean personally uh, in my case uh, my determination and passion uh had like i can say 70 percent the remaining is like maybe 30 percent 20 percent so if you want something really really much then you get it at the end because you look for every opportunity to get uh to reach your goal uh but yeah determination and passion is the most important part of having a, I think, career in science. Dedication. I remember mm. uh, seeing you in the corridor on Sundays uh, in front of La P. <laughs> and I guess <laughs> you and me and maybe one or two more people were the only ones <laughs> on Sunday <laughs> uh, spending time uh, at the laboratory or in the office. <laughs> Uh, but I always like working over the weekends. I mean, uh, because nobody's around, you can use all the instrumentation, everything, and you can finish your work very quickly. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, dedication, determination, and passion is the most important part in, in scientific career, I think. Mm -hmm. I think also you, you, you demonstrated how you need to be flexible. So, yeah. so you might have a a dream or a hope that you you know you'll get a job in Environment Canada, let's say. But if the economic situation isn't right, or you 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 make another decision, you take another path, yeah, and you can make that work. You know you you've been extremely successful in in Turkey, and you've got your group there, and you've got lots of equipment. Uh, and I think you've been quite modest in your presentation because actually a lot of what you've done is uh, the first to do something or yeah, some, of the yeah. first, some of the key papers in our field yeah so, uh, indeed when i left canada first i was quite upset because not finding a position over there it was quite uh, discouraging for me but uh, and first two years in istanbul at that private university it was really really uh, discouraging for me and i was looking like shall i go back to canada or another place in Europe uh, and meanwhile my husband stayed in Canada saying that maybe you will be back to here and with one kid you know what should I do uh, but I was I was so lucky you know finding this position at this university and uh, my luck was I was the first uh, person joined the department and you know and that time you know lots of money from government to set the laboratories everything so uh, I was I was so lucky to set my own laboratory uh, 
Uh, and now, unfortunately, the other people join the department later on. Uh, they don't have such a facility uh, to carry out the research. But yeah, since, uh, you know, I jumped first, <laughs> I got all the profit. <laughs> Any questions, anybody? I have another one. OK. So you very kindly told us your age. <laughs> and you've told us a story about the journey so far and the past. Yeah. So if you look forward the next 10 years, what do you think you will do? Do you think you will you will stick with your science? Do you think you will come under pressure to be a head of department or to take a, a another big job in the university? How how do you think it will go? Mm. Yeah, um, indeed, uh, I was the head of the department and I quit that position four years ago uh, because. I realize this administrative work is not for me. It's so so many so much politics in it, and unfortunately, I'm not a politics person. It's um, uh, I explained like that. Okay, I don't like gray colors. I mean, the color is either white or black for me. I don't want to be in the middle. And unfortunately, administrative people and uh, higher higher administrative. Uh, people at the university, they don't like it. Uh, you said I was so flexible in my life, but unfortunately in such situation, I am not flexible. If something is wrong for wrong, it's always wrong for me. I, I cannot say it is wrong today, but it is right tomorrow. So that's why I quit my position. Now I'm just a faculty member. In 10 years, to be honest, <laughs> I don't plan to stay <laughs> in this position. And if if it becomes true, uh, I would like to benefit from early retirement advantage in Turkey, and I want to get retired in the next maybe three, four years. Uh, I'm a young retired person and spend um, some more time with my kids because uh, I didn't spend much time with them indeed uh, to progress on my career, but I want to spend some time with them and uh, I just want to be more flexible to shuffle around. Okay. Kazim, I can see you, you're there on the call. Do you want to briefly introduce yourself to Perihan? Hello, Professor Perihan. How are you? Hi, Kazim. I'm okay. How are you? I'm fine. It was really encouraging for us to hear you. <laughs> and uh, hopefully, uh, actually, I want to uh, come to your lab in this month, but unfortunately, I hear about your travel plan to Canada end of this month. Yeah. So hopefully, I will join you in late August, maybe. Yeah, OK, yeah. I mean, uh, we keep discussing with Jabir and also uh, Kevin, so uh, I'm sure we will find the most suitable time for your visit to my lab after I come back from Canada. Yeah, but uh, right now I'm the lucky one. I got some opportunity to have been with Professor Kevin. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> enjoy it and benefit a lot from that. <laughs> yeah, I will get benefit now. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Professor Perian. Yeah, thank you very much, Kazim. Yeah, thanks, Kazim. That's great. So um, I guess we we're over the allotted time now. I mean, it's after after two o'clock here. So. Um, Probably we should wrap up. We should say a collective very big thank you, Berhan, for your for your time uh, and your your passion and your story. And uh, let's stay in touch. Uh, we've obviously got lots of collaborations and things we can do together. 
uh, as scientists, but also as, as friends and colleagues. Yes. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much for inviting me and getting in touch and for keeping in touch. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. And Ali, do you, do you have any final word or? We're done. Uh, just to echo the the thank yous and uh, congratulations on a, a excellent career so far. Good luck for the future, especially the early retirement part. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm looking forward to for it. <laughs> um, and uh, thank you very much to Kevin for putting us in touch to to make this seminar happen today. So thank you to everyone for attending and for uh, yeah being part of the discussion. Thank, thank you very you. much, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Barryham. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Have a rest. Have a rest. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Keep okay. in touch. See you soon, hopefully.